So let's get started. Let me just tell you that if you want to ask any questions, feel free to interrupt me so we can get in as many questions as possible, but we will reserve the last 10 minutes of the session so we can answer some questions. So we'll go through half of the presentation. This is the first of two parts, and then we'll continue at a later date. What is LTAD? As you would have heard before, the acronym stands for long-term athlete development. And what it is, is really a way for you to prepare a training and competition and recovery program tailor-made not just for your athlete's age and level, but so you can get to the goals that you want to pursue. It also includes meaningful competition and it's focused on the athletes and not necessarily the coaches. The coaches are the driving tools for LTAD. With that, you need to have your national sporting organizations involved as well as your national Olympic committee for this to be successful. Why LTAD? And that's a very common question. Um, it says that you will need 10 to 12 years planning in order to, to ensure that the athletes get to the level that they want to be. And in more cases than others, it's at the podium or in a medal seeking position. LTAD also develops self-confidence and a mindset required for our athletes to perform at a consistent level at the top. It also ensures a full commitment by the athlete in their pursuit of excellence. It has bearing on the coaches, the national sporting organizations, our national federations, and our IST, which is our integrated sports teams, which consists of our medical experts, doctors, physiotherapists, etc. But even though LTAD on paper seems possible, there are some pillars that will affect or impact LTAD. So I'll just go through the list of them. First and foremost, participants and athletes. Without them, we couldn't be doing this. Uh, competitions, we know comp the scheduling of competitions sometimes can be conflicting. Um, in other instances, it can be conducive to uh, elite performance, but it has a, a serious impact on LTAD. Coaches, again, just as important as participants. Officials, leaders, which are the National Olympic Committee, our national sporting or organizations, our federations, sports medicine and sports science. And this is where sports is going now to a place where it's not good enough just to be talented, but you need integration or integration of science to make a successful plan. Facilities and equipment, this is very relevant in Barbados today. Um, and it causes some challenges, not just in Barbados, but in our region as it relates to sport. Sponsors, you can never have enough money for the development of sport. Press, again, which is very important. Um, our success is dependent upon how, dependent on how the public perceives us and our sport community is not enough just to have uh, athletes and coaches involved, but we need a community of people behind us from a sporting level. Um, just a brief rate upon what is expected of the coach, and the key word here is architect. And your role really is to de design a training plan that helps get the athlete to the end of the year in their decisive competition year. So everything you do in your plan leads up to that decisive competition, whether it be Olympics, Commonwealth, or even something as minimal as your domestic competition. And the coach also has to plan the development of the performance factors and make sure that they are integrated in your plan. Now, LTAD is made up of seven stages. It starts athletes from zero to six years to as old as you want. So the stages are active start, fundamentals, then there's a learning to train stage, training to train, training to compete, training to win, and active for life. So some coaches might not interact with an athlete on every single stage. Obviously, if you're a grassroots coach, you will interact more on the lower level where there's active starts and the fundamental stage. If you're struggling for excellence on the podium, 
then you will find yourself involved with athletes who fall into the train to win and train to compete stage. Active for life, this is actually my favorite. This is where I am now, where you do not necessarily have goals in terms of your performance, but you just want to keep healthy and active. So those are the seven stages of long-term athlete development. So let's start with the first stage, which is active start. And the ages represented here are zero to six for both males and females. And it said that in this stage, you want to be teaching fundamental movement skills. So this is basically what you will do with your toddlers, with your primary school kids. And you find some of the things that are done with athletes at this stage, or some of the sports at this early age, this gymnastics, swimming, and even running. The second stage is the fundamental stage. Notice the emphasis is on fun. That's why the first three letters are in caps, fundamentals. So it doesn't just mean teaching skills, but making sure that the kids have fun. The actual age of the athletes in this, phase, in this phase would be six to nine for males and six to eight for females. And in this stage, you want to be teaching fundamental movement skills as well as fundamental motor skills. And your motor skills are your basic ABCs, which is agility, balance, coordination, and speed. The next stage, stage three, this is the learn to train stage. So this is where the athletes start thinking, not just about movement, but, but a particular sport or several sports, as a matter of fact. So they're thinking about sports and they're looking to do things that uh, complement a particular sport. The ages is nine to 12 and eight to 11. And notice that in most cases, the females start earlier than the males because females generally develop faster than males. The next stage is the training to train stage. Now, this is for athletes ages 12 to 16 male and females 11 to 15. This is where you start thinking about specialization. We have a tendency in Barbados to force athletes to specialize before they are ready. Um, and it tends to cause dropouts and a lot of issues. So not before this age, you would want your athletes to specialize. And even 12 and 11 is too early. So when you're going into 14, 15, 16, this is when you would want them to start thinking about a specific sport skill. And you are building the agent towards that specific skill or sport. And notice it said here, the onset of PHV. This is when you are in your training to train stage. So a little further down in the presentation, we will talk a little bit about PHV. And now we're in the training to compete stage. And this is where it's even more sport specific. So you're not only sport specific, but you start to think about a particular event within your sport or a particular position. So you're optimizing the engine and you're thinking about sport, event, position, skills. So before you may have been doing track and field and running distance races, now you decide, okay, I want to be an 800 meter runner. Or you might have been doing all the sprints and now you decide, I want to be a 400 meter sprinter. So you start to get specific. And the ages are 16 to 23 for males, 15 to 21 for females. Now we're to the training to win stage. And this is again for specific age for males 19 and over, females 18 and over. You're maximizing your engine. Again, you are focusing on a particular event or position of skill, and you are striving for the podium. So, this is where you start thinking about the Olympics, Commonwealth Games, stuff like that, trying to get on the podium. And finally, there's active for life. And you can enter this stage pretty much at every age. Though people generally enter after they've had a, a long and successful or unsuccessful sporting career, then you start thinking about health and longevity and just being active. But in truth and in fact, you can enter active for life at any stage. You don't necessarily have to be a competitive athlete. So I mentioned physical literacy early on when I showed you the, the seven phases. And all physical literacy is 
combining your fundamental movement skills and your ABCs or more skills with your fundamental sport skills. And this is where you get physical literacy. So you're looking at the early stages where you're working on your ABCs and then you go into your sport skills. When you combine that, that's what we call physical literacy. And that speaks to the first three stages of LTA. Again, like anything else, there's always something that impacts or influences anything you try to implement. And there are 10 key factors that influence LTAD. Uh, before I go on, I can entertain some questions about the first seven stages, if anyone has any questions. Ah, yeah, sorry, I was struggling to find my arm. <laughs> The thing to unmute. Um, okay, so we are PE teachers in primary school. Obviously, we'll be dealing with fundamentals, correct? Yeah. Right. Um, my question, this is, a, this, this is a real tough one. We'll see. My question really is, based on what we see in PE in primary schools right now, do you think that we are realistically doing fundamentals or are we completely missing the point? We are by no means we are doing fundamentals. Unfortunately, in the primary schools, we have been sidetracked by sports specific PE and the will to, you know, put our school forward, put our school in front, and uh, compete. And I find the children like the competition, yes, but if you want to develop something more than just that competitive nature, you need to spend a little more time working on fundamentals. Um, because of my unique position, having worked in the primary and secondary schools through the sports council, I have seen kids in secondary school who do not know how to run. And as simple as it sounds, um, their lack of coordination uh, was lacking. I'm not knocking any PE teachers or anything like that. I'm just saying that enough emphasis was not put on the fundamental movement skills, and therefore they go into secondary schools unable to do basic things that should in turn make them better athletes when they start to specialize. Does that answer your question? Definitely, and I, I got a follow up. What, okay. like, what, <laughs> what do you think is a step that we can take as, a, as really a country to really change the focus of what's going on? Because the pro to me, the problem is the society and the view of what PE is in Barbados and mm -hmm. also the desire, as you said, for your school to be the best all the time instead of for your children to go on to be the best. Uh, well, we, we need to decide as a community of PE teachers and coaches what it is we want to get out of our session. And based on what I'm telling you, fundamentals and learning motor skills and movement skills is that all we need to do is teach it. Um, yes, the kids will get to play sport, but let the basis of your physical education session be on fundamental movement skills. You can divide the time between doing that. Let's say if you have a one-hour PE session, you can dedicate the first half an hour to teaching the kids how to run, the correct technique of running, jumping, throwing, stuff like that before we start looking at a sport. It might mean you might need to extend your PE session so that you can incorporate both but you should not replace your full PE session with a sport specific activity. I would like to also say something. This is Adele. Okay. Um, is it a case then of maybe the powers that be needs re-educating as to what physical education actually entails? Um, I think they are aware. I think some may be, need to be reminded, but I also think that pressure comes from even outside the, the PE department for our PE teachers to produce or to get the school to a certain point. Look at NASA, for example, is the highlight of any physical activity in any school and is always something that the principals look forward to. The people like to know their school do really well. So maybe the PE teachers get a little bit of pressure from maybe the, the head at the school or the head of the department to focus there. So it's, it's just a matter of getting the people on the outside within the community educated and showing them the benefits in terms of long term to having fundamentals and not just sports specific. 
Thank you. Great. Um, I had a, a very quick question. First of all, I thought that um, Kevin's questions were very um, critical to the conversation. So thank you so much, Kevin, for your questions. Um, going back to the fundamentals and drawing on a point that was made to about PE teachers and actually sticking to these fundamentals, we have an issue where in some PE teachers, um, and in my opinion, too many PE teachers are drawn from the classroom and are kind of reluctant participants in the whole discipline. Yes. Is there a, a resource that we can actually share with, with, um, with PE teachers that would help them in terms of prescribing the correct fundamentals for their, um, for their sessions so that we could actually have a standardized way of building all of these students up? Because <clears throat> persons like myself and I assume Kevin and many other PE teachers, we have our minds towards building athletes that when you get them in secondary school, um, they can have a firm foundation from which they can flourish and develop as opposed to just trying to build winning teams in primary school, right? And I know everybody's thought pattern is not quite like that, but it would be great if we were actually to have um, resources that would help PE teachers to stick to the correct way or the prescribed way of bringing up these young athletes to hand them over to the next stage of development for them. So if there is a developmental um, tool or program or resource, you know, it'd be great to know. Well, that's a very interesting point and very relevant. Um, we have a lot of people attempting to teach physical education who are not certified. Um, it's not their fault. They were put in positions. In some instances, the school does not actually have a PE teacher. So it starts it kind of starts there. I believe there should be a physical education teacher certified in every school. And in the absence of that, um, the Barbados Olympic Association offers a lot of courses, not necessarily for coaches, but people who deem themselves coaches would sit in. And it teaches basic introduction and, and, and grassroots um, information in terms of what you can do with kids at different ages. Um, I don't know if it's something that the PE teachers would be willing to take part in, but they definitely need help. If you cannot be helped by an existing PE teacher in the school, then you have to look outside the school. And this is what the Barbara Olympic Association is for. Um, it's not going to be, you're not going to get an associate degree, but you can get a certificate of participation and then you are more equipped to impart knowledge on the kids that you are dealing with. But you have to seek help outside of the school if you at least want the people teaching PE to have a basic knowledge of what is required. Thank you so much. All right, so we're gonna move on now to the influence. Uh, and the first one is, I'm gonna read the 10 out to you, but we're just going to go through about half of them. Presentation, we'll talk about um, the other, the ones that we didn't talk about today. So it's excellent state's time, fundamentals, specialization, growth, development, and maturation, windows of trainability, mental, cognitive, emotional development, periodization and training principles, system alignment and integration, the system of competition with respect to the calendar year, and continuous improvement. So these are 10 factors that influence LTAD. So we start with the first one, excellent state time. All this is telling you, um, search has shown the 10 to 10,000, 10 year to 10,000 hour rule. It takes 10 years of extensive practice to excel, excel in anything, not just sport, but this is a general school of thought. Um, but since this was issued many, many years ago, um, there has been some research that suggests there are some things that could be taken into consideration. And they looked at things like genetics, um, culture, um, race and ethnicity, because as you know, it may take me 10 years to excel at the 10,000 meter and an African might come and, you know, get to the podium in five years. So they look at other factors outside the issue of time to determine how long it takes to excel at a particular skill. Fundamentals, 
This is the second factor that influences LTAD. And we had mentioned briefly before what uh, fundamentals entail. Again, I'll go over it. Fundamental movement skills and fundamental motor skills. Uh, when you come back, combine that with sports skills, that is what we call physical literacy. So when your athlete possess all of these skills, the ABCs, movement skills, sports specific skills, they are said to be physically literate. And this you happens. And these are some of the basic fundamentals. You can identify them without even having them um, captioned. The first one is balance. Then you have walking, running, jumping, hopping, catching, throwing, hitting, kicking. These are the things that we should be teaching specifically in the primary schools before we even think about sports skills. So these are the fundamental movement skills you want to teach your kids before the age of 10, 11. And there's a saying, no ABCs and you're out. So notice the ABCs are highlighted in green, which is agility, balance, coordination, speed. Those are the most, um, those are the, the, the fundamental movement skills and motor skills that you want to instill in the kids. But bearing in mind that there are also other aspects of fundamentals to consider, time and space orientation. That is one that people tend not to put any emphasis on our training. Reaction time, and these are these can be specific to sports as well. So reaction time, dexterity, movement frequency, adaptation, capacity to specific environment. So along with your fundamental uh, movement skills and more skills, these are the things that kids should possess before ages 10 and 11. Factor number three is specialization. This is my favorite because again, we tend to specialize too early. But you can see that there are some early specialization sports and there are also late specialization sports. The early specialization sports tend to be sports like gymnastics, rhythmic gymnastics, figure skating, diving, swimming, synchronized swimming. And then the late specialization sports, all other sports, pretty much. So if you do not fall under this right hand column, you should not be telling a child at seven, eight, nine, ten that you should just play my sport, pretty much. And this is pretty much the pros and cons, cons of specialization. And it says that, special, that athletes who have specialized early may have reached their peak at juniors. So if you're looking to get on the podium, you may very well have peaked before you get the opportunity to get to the podium at a senior level. Many have retired before reaching seniors. I have seen that before. And very few have improved their top performances as seniors. So this is as a result of early specialization. And it says, in terms of the best athletes, many started out in a sport seven to eight years of age, focusing on general development. And these are sports like football, athletics, swimming, cycling, gymnastics, etc. There's there's often systematic training and specialization between athletes ages 15 to 18 years of age. So that's what happen, usually happens with, or should happen with sports like football, swimming, etc. They do not necessarily dominate at the junior level. Again, once they specialize at the right time, they don't necessarily dominate at junior level, but they start to excel after five or eight years of specific training, which is what you are obviously aiming for. Not saying that you will not have junior athletes who are really good at what they do, but you're not forcing specialization because of all the things I mentioned before. And the best athletes are the ones who tend to wait. And five years into your specialization, they tend to excel or get to the podium or where they need to be. Can I interject for one second to highlight a sport oh, where sure, we really sure. over specialize early? And we yeah. receive a lot of success. Cricket. We have our junior cricket team usually wins most tournaments, even against those from England or whatever. However, how many Beijing cricketers are we say, can we say are excelling right now? Yeah, I know. I, I know. Well, our level well. of fear of cricket is mm -hmm. the issue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And it's, it's not just cricket, it's other sports as well. Um, I. Go ahead. 
highlighted symbol. So this tells me that my decimal of point. Okay. All right, let's move on. All right. So still talking about specialization, major problems. First, we make a player, and after we want to make an athlete out of a player. What we really should be doing is reversing the procedure. So you have to make an athlete first and make a player out of the athlete. So basically that is saying teaching fundamental skills, then you get the sport specific aspect of training. All right, factor four, growth division. And funny enough, a lot of people, they know, I think people know that this, yeah, this determines pretty much um, a lot. Talent identification and stuff. We look at growth and maturation. We match people to sports based on how they grow, how they mature, how they develop. But there's a saying that a Chinese bamboo takes six years to grow 15 centimeters. Then it grows another three meters in six months. Has it grown three meters in six months or three meters and 15 centimeters in six years and six months? So I'll leave you to think about that a little bit. But um, some of the things that we are tasked with is the chronological age versus the biological or developmental age. Here we have a picture of six kids who are the same age. But look at number 21. Look at how he has grown and matured in comparison to the others. So this is where growth and maturation plays a major role. And a lot of the time, training is based on chronological age. So. They're saying athlete can be four or five years apart by maturation levels, but chronically they are the same age. And this is a classic example here. So these are the, some of the things that they talk about when we talk about growth, maturation and development. Growth, you're actually looking at size, at the size, uh, proportion, physique. Maturation, you look at the skeletal, sexual, somatic, dental, and neuromuscular aspects. And in terms of development, so you look at their cognitive development, emotional, social, even moral, and more to behavior. But they all lead to self-concept, self-esteem, and perceived confidence. So I'm just going to run through this last thing here before you can ask a few more questions. And this basically talks about the phases of growth. So if you can follow my mouse here. Now, so it says that between the ages of zero, and about two, there is a very rapid growth. So you're a baby, you're, sorry. Right, so you're pretty much born, you begin to grow, but there's a rapid growth. So here this blue line represents a very rapid growth between the ages of zero and two. Between the ages of three to six, there's a very rapid deceleration. So growth has not stopped. It just means you start to grow at a slower rate, all right? So that's phase one of growth. Phase two, between the ages of six and 11, there's a steady growth. So you probably will be the same height throughout that period or very similar in height throughout that period. And that usually goes up to 11, 11 and a half. Now remember we mentioned PHV earlier. That actually stands for peak height velocity. So that is where you get a very rapid growth and then deceleration as you get a little older. And that usually happens between 11 and a half and 13, 13, 13 and a half. But one thing you can um, use to identify with this is the time, not just the age, but for you, especially primary school teachers, you usually recognize it when your kids sit the common entrance exam, they leave you, they go into secondary school, and when you see them again, they've grown many inches taller and you're amazed. It's just that they're at that age where the PHV occurs, which is the peak height velocity. So that usually happens between 11 and 13. So they leave primary school, they go into secondary school, and they're much taller, a lot more mature. Between the ages of 13 and 15, you see here there is a rapid deceleration. And by the time you get to 15, there's a slow deceleration. So slowing, sorry, growing slows down but not as, as, as much as when you were 13, 14. So a 15 year old and a 19 year old might look very similar in height and maturity, hence you would have 
some 50 euros walking around your school with beard and you might have some 17, 18 euros that actually don't have beard. So there's a very slow deceleration. When you get to 19, growth pretty much stops. So understanding the phases of growth helps when you are developing your training program, your training plan, when you're looking at training factors, when you're trying to look at talent identification and pairing people with sports, you need to understand how the human body grows for our different sexes so that you understand where to put a particular athlete. Okay, so I will stop here for some questions. I have a question out of the chat. Question is, there is a large drop off in students coming out of primary school into secondary school where sports is concerned. Can that be accredited to specific application to early yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, definitely. Um, I've seen in, in, in um, um, my sport, um, um, in, 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 in the one of my sports, where for the, for the last two years of primary school, school, the emphasis is on preparing for the primary school competition, the emphasis is on winning, or uh, even placing, and somewhere along the line, especially if the, the school does not win, the child tends to Either they're willing to go, go and find another sport or try another sport and they leave that sport completely behind or they lose interest and then they only want to play sometimes. So then the secondary school teacher have a task of trying to motivate the kids to want to play the sport again. So I think maybe they're pushed too hard too early in terms of doing well in a specific sport and they tend to lose interest and focus. Any more questions? There's not the chart. Yeah. There's the floor. Would you recommend, this is from me, mm -hmm. would you recommend that in our primary schools, yeah. they lead more towards talent identification? Definitely. Definitely. And the reason I said it is because I coach basketball. And, and when I go to school, I, I get kids who can come and get involved with the ring. Granted, granted, it was not um, uh, adaptable for that, that age group, but, but I will have a set of kids who can do it quite easily. And then, and then I have a set, set I get them class two, three, four, 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 for sports like football, you look at things like speed and agility. So definitely knowing um, how the children go and how the children develop would help if you have access to that information. And you have your specific preparation phase. Your competition phase, in this instance, this example is broken down into two phases. So this could be a minor competition, maybe domestic, you can also have a major competition, which can be CAC Games, Commonwealth, Olympics, depending on what level you are at. So that is broken down into two phases. And you always have your transition phase. This is where you focus on recovery and rejuvenation. So once you've established your phases, you go on to look at your mesocycles. Now, each phase can be broken down into mesocycles. In the preparation phase, we have two mesocycles, the conditioning mesocycle. So this is where you look at, your again, your strength training, your strength train endurance, the flexibility, all your energy systems. Then you have a general basic mesocycle. This is where you start to get a little more specific. So your training is geared towards your specific sport. And when you get to your specific basic mesocycle, which is the third block here, this is when you start looking at the actual sport, the skill, the rules, and the tactical aspects of your sport. The competition phase is broken down also into mesocycles. So in the competition one, you have one full mesocycle that can range from, let's say, four to six weeks, depending on your sport. In your competition phase two, this is where you have more than one mesocycle, and you can see a block between here where you have a taper. So you can have your competitions in that first block, which is your comp mesocycle, where remember in phase two, where you have comp mesocycle, you can have your competition there. But somewhere between 
your competition mesocycle cycle and just before you get to your peak competition which is leading up to your playoff stages you want to have a taper a taper is basically reducing your training load um not to a minimal but not all the way down so that when you get into your competition phase you are ready to peak that assists with the peaking so a taper is just a reduction in your training load and then you go into your competition phase where your body is allowed to peak so the competition phase is broken down into two mesocycles and a taper in the transition phase there's a recovery mesocycle now in this phase people tend to get mixed up with what is considered recovery for a sport like let's say netball basketball football volleyball sports that require a lot of impact pounding in your recovery mesocycle you want to stay away from anything that is similar to the sports that you are already playing so you want to do things like cycling swimming long walks easy jogs um stuff like that and recovery is not just about exercising it's also about taking care of the body so this is the time where you want to do take your ice baths your massages and anything you can do to help rejuvenate the body in this phase you want to take consume a lot of fluids liquids because this is at the end of your yearly training cycle and you are preparing your body to do this all over again so the recovery meals of cycle is not just about being active but taking care of your body after you've established your mesocycles, then each mesocycle is now broken down into microcycles. So your microcycle can go from two to six days. And all your microcycle do is plan your a block of activities um, for, let's say, two days to a week in your conditioning mesocycle. So my first microcycle, which is the first yellow block, this is under my conditioning mesocycle. I can decide for three days in that first period, I am going to do a five mile run Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So that is my first middle cycle. So all you need to do in that phase is determine what you want to train, how long you want to train it, and that becomes your middle cycle. In the second middle cycle, which will be the second yellow block, I can choose to work on strength. So I include two days of gym training and it becomes a five day micro cycle. So basically your microcycle tells you what you're going to do week by week. Right at the bottom where you have session, this is the actual session on the day. So if I decide that I'm working on conditioning on a particular day, this will break down exactly what I'm going to do. My warm up, what the main part of my session is going to be like, the main activities, the cool down, etc. So this is just an overview of what your annual training cycle will look like. There are so much more details to be included, but this is the basic framework you start with when you are looking at your macro cycle. And obviously you add dates to the different periods and phases so you know, and you start with your competition date and work your way backwards so that you know exactly what you need to do leading up to competition. So moving along. Um, in training, we look at two factors, volume and intensity. And in your preparation phase or the early phase of your macro cycle, the red line represents the volume, while the blue line represents the intensity of the training session. And in the general preparation phase, where your volume is high, which means you're doing a lot more repetitions, working a lot more days, working on multi multiple energy systems, so you have high volume, your intensity is low. As you get into your competition phase and you move along the macro cycle, you will see that the blue line surpasses the red line or gets close to the same level. And that is where your intensity increases and your volume reduces. So you might tend to practice less days, but then the intensity of your training goes up. And that kind of plateaus throughout your competition phase intensity high volume is low and then decline significantly significantly when you get to your transition phase which is when you should be now winding down and, and bringing your body back down to zero both the volume and the intensity reduces but the intensity reduces more rapidly um, any questions before we move on
Okay, so moving on. So planning, planning, training and competition recover and recovery. There are a lot of factors that decide how successful your competition or recovery plan will be. And it's a team effort. So it can't be done by one person. The head coach generally is the leader of this team, but you need your nutritionists, your planning experts, your physiotherapists, conditioning coaches, administrators, uh, mental preparation, medical staff. Don't forget your assistant coach. These are all people that are needed to make sure that your planning, training, and competition and recovery plan is followed to a T, to the point where you can get success from your plan. The planning process um, is one that should be given a lot of thought. You want to analyze, design, and imp implement, and evaluate the plan before putting it out there. And to analyze the plan, you must consider a few things. Your contextual reality. This is a phrase that is thrown around a lot when you travel outside of Barbados because we tend to compare our reality to the reality of bigger countries or even smaller, less developed countries. And the truth is the reality is often very different. Um, we have issues with facilities, funding, um, sometimes the pool of athletes to choose from is not what we would like, whereas larger countries like the US, Canada, and countries in Europe, they have a very large pool to choose from. So it's a lot easier for them. So their contextual reality will be a lot different to ours. Demands of the sport. Um, that too is something that we, we need to consider when we are implementing our plan. The athlete status. The set objectives. And then we design the plan. Implementation is last. So you analyze, you set your objectives, you design a plan, and then you implement. After you've implemented your plan, you always evaluate. This would help you determine where you need to go in the next instance, next year, how you want to go forward, what needs to be changed, and what needs to be improved. So always have your evaluation at the end. So we're going to very quickly just go through important factors to consider when planning. So we said we're, they're saying that planning is a combination of art and science, but one of the most important aspects of sports performance is the athlete and making sure the athlete is in the best shape at the right time. Um, in some instances, we can have the best possible plan, but if the athlete is not in the best shape, more often than not, the plan is doomed to fail. Planning is also mandatory in order to adapt to unforeseen circumstances, again, like injuries, changing the dates in local or major competitions. This is very common in our region, and so many other things that can um, change the focus of our plan. It is imperative to reach top competition form at the right time, not before or not after. Therefore, planning is necessary to move from the actual state to the ideal state. So you want to get your athlete from an athlete who is capable of competing locally to a stage where you can compete regionally or even internationally. So this is where planning plays a very big role. You have to make sure that you set your objectives and you reach the objectives and the anticipated result. So a famous quote, one that I like very much, if you fail to prepare, prepare to fail. Now, in looking at training objectives, two of the more important ones we tend to look at, especially with team sports, are the technical and the tactical aspects. When um, teaching a skill, how you present the skill to the athlete makes all the difference. So you pretty much want to introduce the skill. This is the stage where the athlete is now learning the skill. And it is a new skill or a tactical component. And you want to introduce this skill in a stable and easy environment or easy 
conditions. So when you're teaching an athlete and they're trying to learn a new skill, you want to make sure that it's attainable, it's not too easy, but the conditions are such that the athlete is able to acquire the skill. The key emphasis is on comprehension of what I have to do as an athlete and proper execution of this assignment. So while you are focusing on putting the skill in a way that the athlete can learn, the athlete must be able to understand what you're saying and what they need to do in order to achieve proper execution of the skill or the assignment. The characteristics, this is basically how you want the athlete to acquire the skill. This is in a sub-maximal speed. So obviously when you're teaching a new skill, the speed of execution, although relevant in the learning or acquisition stage, you want the athlete to be able to do it at a speed that they can control and they can understand, but they still want success. And they basically have to be in a state of readiness or concentration to acquire these skills. So that's the acquisition stage. So once they've acquired the skill, then you seek as a coach to develop the skill. And this is basically to pursue the learning process in control conditions without opponents or with the complexity of opponents. So you can have it both ways. So they've already learned the skill and in order to develop the skill and make sure that they understand what is needed to execute the skill. You can do it with an opponent or you can do it without. And the key emphasis here is going to be on success rate and any result. So it's said that for any learning to take place, you would have had to execute a seven out of 10 correctly. So the objective is to make sure that whatever skill you teach, the athlete is able to do it competently seven out of 10 times. So that's the developing stage. The characteristics to bear, to bear in mind is a block of repetitions of the assignment as determined by the coach. So you don't just want to do it seven out of 10 times, but you want to do it multiple times to make sure that the athlete um, understands and is able to replicate the skill. For the coach, the drill is isolated from competition reality. So speed is gradual. So the focus is not just on speed of execution, but um, a gradual buildup until the athlete is competent. Requirements, they must be in a state of readiness and concentration. After you have acquired and developed the skill, now you want to consolidate it. So this is basically to stabilize the element of the technical or tactical or strategy in controlled conditions by the coach or semi-control conditions or random conditions. So control conditions would obviously be in a practice or in a drill, semi-control conditions. Um, you can add defense or defenders so that you do not necessarily know the outcome or it could be random conditions where you have a game type situation or um, competition and the players do not know what to expect from the opponents. So once they are able to, to execute the skill, is said to be consolidated. This framework requires opponents and opposition or confrontation. So while you're in this consolidation stage, you want to do it with, especially for team sports, with defenses. The emphasis will be at this stage now on decision making by the player, um, high success rate. So Although seven out of 10 is acceptable, you tend to want to aim for a 10, a 10 out of 10 success rate. And now you're on to optimal speed of execution. So before it was uh, sub-maximal speed or even gradual, now you want to execute, because it's a game situation, you want to execute the optimal speed of execution. And the requirements, like to moderate state of fatigue. So this is something that you would not, you would not look to call a holiday a skill at the beginning of your practice while you're still fresh. So deep into your practice, maybe halfway in or coming close to the end, when you get to your competitive stage, that is when you want to look at consolidating a skill where the athlete is in a moderate state of fatigue. So after you've consolidated the skill, you want to refine and maintain a repertoire of techniques, tactics, and strategies. So this is basically just polishing up the skills you already you have already consolidated. Improve the elements in controlled conditions or semi-controlled conditions or random conditions. So again, in a drill setting with and without teammates. The key emphasis here is going to be on decision making as related to the situation or success rate, which is known as your end result. So in a team sport, you want to win. In an individual sport where time is significant, you want to be the specific time. The characteristics, approximated or absolute competition. 
game-like conditions linked with optimal speed of, con of execution. So in your main maintenance and refinement stage, you look at this mostly in game situations. Okay, so continuing factor seven, we just um, looked at planning and preparation. So now we're gonna move on to factor eight, which is competition calendar planning. And there's a saying that competition is a good servant, but a poor master. And the things we need to consider when we're looking at our competition year. Does the coach have enough time to develop the athlete before the competition season begins? Um, this is a question that we don't ask ourselves enough. I know it's very common within our national programs where more often than not, it's not our fault. We tend to want to wait or we wait to find out when an international competition is being held. You know, sometimes the date changes, the age changes, the venue changes, and then the national federations are somewhat delayed in choosing a coach. And somewhere between the three to two month mark prior to the competition, you're asked and we accept. We often take the task knowing that you are starting at a disadvantage. And when we do fail, we, we blame it on a lack of time. But we go into the job knowing full that we don't have enough time to, comp to prepare a team for a competition. Um, and this is, for me, this is a major problem as a coach. And this is something that happens too often. So as coaches, until we put down our foot and say, no, we can't do it, then the national federations associations will continue to um, give us teams and groups to coach with limited time to prepare. So this is the, one of the main things you want to ask yourself when you're approached by the National Federation about coaching. Do you have enough time to develop the athletes before the com competition begins? Does the actual system of competition favor the athlete development? Does the coach have time to improve the performance capacities? Um, namely the four performance factors we spoke about, the physical, the technical, technical, tactical, and mental of the athletes between key competitions. Are they dictated schedules or selective? How can you develop talent when you compete more than you train? Um, that is something that's also specific to our territory. Um, we tend to focus a lot more on competition and a lot less on training. And F1 has to suffer is generally the training aspect or the developmental aspect and not the competition. So we compete at all costs and we put competition ahead of training. So these are some of the questions you need to ask yourself as coaches. That was very short. Um, factor nine, system building, alignment and integration. And you can see the, the famous Court without actually having a court where the government bodies usually have their heads in the sand. They are very clueless as to what is going on. Um, the integration they're talking about is not um, is also specific to our region. There must be some unity, communication, synchronization between the physical education um, programs and school sports, the community and recreation and the high performance and organized sports. If there's no integration between the three, then the whole structure will fall. So it says that these three organizations are mutually interdependent. Separate development is ineffective and expensive. So um, this is the foundation for our physical literacy. So you definitely need your physical education teachers who are tasked with looking at the fundamentals um, and the ABCs and community plays a big role in, in getting even some of the younger kids out and active before they can get to the high performance stage. So there needs to be integration amongst these three entities. Factor 10, which is continuous improvement. All aspects of long-term athlete development needs research related um, to um, implementation. The course should regularly do critical analysis of the decisions taken on actions implemented. Read the recent literature, sports specific and scientific. Be open to change if you wish to be leading rather than be trying to catch up. So basically this is just saying um, for continuous improvement to occur, you need to 
stay abreast and on top of what is going on. You need to do your research. You need to be accepting of change and not just the idea of change coming from somebody else, but be a part of the plan, be a part of the change and always make sure there is critical analysis of each decision that you take. This is just, this picture is pretty much self-explanatory. Um, the peak is barely above water, but the foundation so much below water. This is where you want to be focused on. This is where most of the focus should be going. That big block of ice below the surface, you tend to want to put most of your energy in there as opposed to above the top, which is, which is where we see the podium or the major games. You put all the funding, all the focus into that aspect of your sport. You neglect the bottom or below the surface and eventually it will sink. So um, that's a few quotes. Ideas lead to a dream that requires preparation. To achieve your dream, you will have to overcome tremendous obstacles that will cause you to have to revisit your dream. And sometimes you will have to remind yourself where you do what you do. I know I happen to have that, not problem, but that is something that I have to tell myself daily or remind myself why, especially when things don't go necessarily the way you want them to or you see them going. So final words on long-term athlete development. Start off with physical literacy. That's in the first three stages of LTAD. Make sure you have your foundations, your fundamentals, and your basis covered as it relates to um, your fundamental movement skills and more skills. Cash in on the windows of trainability. We spoke um, about the five S's, when to train what, what ages, when you get the best results between um, males versus males, and when are, when are they no longer significant in your particular sport. Improve talent ID system. This is something that um, we mentioned it early on in part one of the presentation where we tend to fall down. Um, we generally choose, some in some instances, the wrong um, athlete or type of athlete for a particular sport. So we want to, make sure that when we do our talent identification, that we look at the attributes of a particular sport to a particular athlete. Improve the systems of competition. Again, competition should by no means overshadow training. Work on system alignment and integration, structures and programs. So there needs to be integration between the schools, uh, the community, and the high performance are elite coaches of athletes. We need good coaches at the learning to train and training to train stage. So we don't want all our best coaches, again, at the top of the pinnacle where you're looking at the podium and getting to the Olympics. You need to have the some of your better coaches in the developmental stage to get the athletes to the next level. Health and well-being of the athlete always, always come first. So that's the end of my presentation. I will take any questions you might have at this time, any particular slide you want to revisit. I'm here to assist. In regards to the year program, mm -hmm. where you had it, mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on Programs for level with English and your program for each level of athlete, or if you should focus your, your program on just one particular level. Um, you can have a general yearly program, but the program has to be tailor made to the athletes. Obviously, the sport. Um, the time that your competition is done, whether it's an individual or team sport, and yes, the skill level of the athlete. You can have a general framework for your yearly training program, but the level of the athlete um, has a lot to do with how you prepare your plan. Um, case in point, you will find that in your preparation period, um, where you tend to spend a lot more time looking at skill acquisition and development, your training 
your annual cycle might be a bit longer in that period versus your competition period. If you have an elite athlete or even a professional athlete who is looking to go to the highest level, they might tend to compete a little more than an athlete at the introductory level. So then your competition period might look a little different. And again, an athlete who goes hard all year round, your transition period might be a little longer than an athlete who is not competing at such a high level. So yet the, the, the skill set and the level of the athlete will determine how you plan your macro cycle, definitely. Another question coming in now in the chat. What are some of the suggestions you may have as it relates to our sporting calendars mm -hmm. in order to improve them? Um, well, from a school perspective, my main issue first is availability of the athlete. You, as you would know in the school setting in term one we tend to have multiple sports going on at the same time so you have your best athlete running from a basketball game to a football game to even a cricket game or you might have one athlete competing in two sports in the same day or an athlete missing out on um, a major game or a major part of the competition because they are trying to uh, play multiple sports. So that is one of the things we need to look at to, to be able to approve the level of competition. Um, so, and it's not just in the school setting, but there are major clashes in domestic competitions within our country. I know as a netballer, I had to compete, a netballer and a basketballer, both sports compete. I got left off of national teams because I was on one team and because I wanted to make maybe one team more than the other, I was not able to put focus my energy in more than one sport. So the timing and scheduling of our domestic seasons, our school competition, plays a big part in how our uh, training program looks and in terms of the availability of athletes. So if you take time out to go ahead and put together a training program for athletes and then they're not, they're not able to attend training sessions half of the time, then your plan is not working. This one is from me. Breaking down our primary schools as opposed to our secondary schools. Mm -hmm. Within our primary school setting, we are in that training to train type phase mm -hmm. where we're looking to bring those forward, but a lot of primary schools mm -hmm. still tend to focus on winning and that. Um, for those teachers who are more focused on developing that athlete and looking mm -hmm. forward down the road, mm -hmm. what advice would you have for them mm -hmm. as the primary schools? Yeah. And then for teachers who are about to receive children who may have mm -hmm. some of that long-term mm -hmm. development program, mm -hmm. what advice would you have for them then as a secondary school mm -hmm. so that they don't kind of go backwards yeah. in mm -hmm. development? Um, like we mentioned early in the presentation about this thing about winning and schools having to compete in every competition because it comes from higher than the actual PE teacher. The thing is to get every all the parties involved on the same page. I'm not saying there's not a place for competition, but I'm sure that as a teacher you are required to write some type of plan, maybe a unit plan. Um, you want to make your plan in a way that you focus on skill development and, and fundamental movement skills and fundamental motor skills. And once you focus on that, the competition becomes a natural part of the process. And there must be some synchronization between a primary school program and a secondary school program so there's some level of fluency. So if I learn netball in primary school, when I go into the secondary school, there should be some sort of synchronization. So you go straight into an already structured program having grasp the fundamental aspect of whatever sport or whatever you are doing but the whole idea is to have communication and synchronization if not true the entire primary to secondary school at least between class four and class class four in primary school and class one in secondary school so there is in fact a smooth transition Okay, all right, so that's the end of our long term athlete development presentation. Thanks for joining us, and we hope we can see you again soon. <laughs>